So whether you're little tiny, you're really big, if I can connect to you, I would love to have it because I would love to say, hey, New York Times, here's everything that we're moving through this industry. Hey, BookScan, make sure you get all this stuff reported so it shows up on the list. It's time for another episode of The Sean Tavitt Show, a podcast where I connect you with thought leaders from across the globe, digging into some of my favorite topics like personal development, marketing, spirituality, and pretty much any other shiny object that happens to catch my attention. Today, my special guest is Eric Ernstrom, and we are going to be discussing the ins and outs of reporting book sales so they can get properly counted for bestseller list recognition. Eric, it is truly an honor, sir. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Sean. Appreciate it. Let's kick off our conversation with a bit of what we might call the Eric Ernst from Origin Story. You and I have had a chance to talk a few times the past couple of years, but I know you are going to be new to many of my listeners. So tell us a few of the things we need to know about you. I started in the Christian industry in 1991 at our local Christian bookstore. Actually, I was looking for a job and knew the owner and he hired me to work his back room. So I was doing returns, receiving that kind of stuff. Ended up within a couple of years managing the store. Did that for a couple of years and then got hired out at the Parable Group. So I was at the Parable Christian Bookstore and went out to the Parable Group to run their basically customer service department, working with hundreds of Christian bookstores, helping with marketing. And then we started a data side of things. We were collecting data for mailing lists and we said, let's expand this to inventory and transactional information so we can just serve up more stuff to the stores. And so we built out a business intelligence team and I was part of that, ended up managing that and I still do that. So... I've been in the Christian industry for a very long time. I like to tell people I started when I was seven. Um, <laughs> that's not true, but it makes me feel better. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, early 90s for you, I kind of remember my first Christian retail experience would have been in 97. So not too many years after you. It's always fascinating to me when I encounter folks who are in the industry. So many of us started out in the bookstore space. And here we are all these years later, you know, doing some important function within the Christian book market. So. It's nice to connect with a fellow former Christian retail aficionado. I love the the retail side of it. I miss that still. It's been a very long time since I've been out there. And that was the one, when I got hired to come out to this job, I remember sitting down with the boss and saying, I'm going to miss a store. I mean, putting stuff in somebody's hands and, hey, you're going to love this book. He goes, yeah, but now you get to do that for stores all over the country, not just in one. You're helping them put that book in hands. I'm like, hey, yeah, I like that. (laughs) That's a win. I can do that. It's a good thing to be able, in this industry, put something in somebody's hands that's going to hopefully change their or somebody else's lives. And that's just a big piece of why I'm still doing it. That's one of the things that I found is such a big asset, you know, getting to start out in the bookstore space and kind of getting to do all the jobs behind the scenes to run a store. And it's not to say people can't have a good experience coming into the publishing space and related kind of spaces without bookstore experiences, but the opportunity to engage with customers and answer their questions and put that book in their hand. It is such a powerful and valuable thing to really understand the experience of the retailers that a lot of us partner with and and with the customers and their experience as well. One of the things I tried to do as much as I could back when I was at Bethany House and Chosen Books was to bring my staff on the road. And I, I had a marketing and PR team, but when we would have events where we were selling books, I would encourage them as much as possible to work the book table and answer questions and let literally take money from the customers and do all the things. Because that one-to-one interaction with customers, answering questions and and that sort of thing, it's invaluable. It really helps you to understand the whole process in a way that you just can't if you've not had that experience. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. I mean, just, again, putting that thing in their hand, but then hearing from them, oh yeah, my brother read this. He also liked XYZ. And you've got, hey, that's something else I can now recommend to somebody else because both of those benefit. So yeah, being part of that, because if you come in, if you're too removed, it's hard. That's why I like still going back into our local store. I don't work there, but I try and go in there as frequently as I can. Because just to be in there with that staff and talk to them about what they're doing, what's working still, that kind of stuff is invaluable, especially for what we do out here. Now, Eric, you and I have connected the past few years related to the reporting of book sales and bestseller lists. And so for this next part of the conversation, I'd like to start that off by just having you maybe share a bit about what are some of the biggest shifts you've seen in the past five years? Because I'm thinking from when I first met you two, three years ago to now there have been shifts in kind of reporting and requirements and what's the norm. What are some of the biggest shifts you've seen maybe in the past five years? Biggest thing specifically in our industry is the loss of chains. You know, family going away, Lifeway going away. That was a huge hit to all the reporting agencies, whether it's New York Times, BookScan, those guys, SoundScan on the music side. 
those were some big declines they saw really fast that they've had to account for and call out when they're charting stuff. So there's been a huge push recently to move toward or try and expand on the indie side. How many more stores can we get in? Because we need to fill those holes. And the chains did most of the reporting. They were the overwhelming majority. And so trying to backfill now and say, okay, let's go get as many of the little guys, for lack of a better way to say it. But there's so many of them out there and their sales aren't getting reporting. Where they're just disappearing. They're not even appearing in the first place. Do they sell books and that's it. As opposed to, hey, can we get that data in so the rest of the world can know what's moving in our channel? Shows some vitality to the channel. Shows this channel is still very viable. But people need to see that. So the more data we can collect from all the indies out there and get it in there will help tell that story. I will say in terms of the Christian industry with the going away of Lifeway and Family Christian, I have really appreciated, uh, especially Barnes & Noble, at least with in my area and a lot of the Barnes & Noble stores I go to as I travel around the country. In terms of their displays for Christian products and Christian books, I've seen a lot of stores with two to three times the size of displays than, say, I saw a year previous when I was maybe last in that store when I was traveling. And so I have been encouraged that I've seen Barnes & Noble and also in Books a Million as well. I've seen them kind of pick up that slack or try to absorb some of that market demand that was filled by some of those other stores. And so two friends from Books a Million or Barnes & Noble, if you might be listening, thank you. Appreciate that you're helping us to put books in the hands of customers. Next, Eric, I'd love to get into some of the specifics of the work that you do at the Parable Group to help really retailers of all shapes and sizes to report their sales. And and one of the interesting things is there are tons of books that are moving these days through more on the side that I work with right now is ministers who are itinerant and travel all over the world and they're selling books and products everywhere that they go. There are a lot of churches and ministries that have literal physical bricks and mortars stores, maybe at their church or in their ministry center where they're selling products. So in terms of the Christian space, there are all of these out of the norm retail situations that isn't just, you know, like your traditional brick and mortar bookstore down the street. So talk to us about kind of the range of stuff that the Parable Group is doing to collect and help get that data distributed. And maybe some of the range of the different types of quote unquote stores that you're working with these days. Yeah, well, I'll start with that one. We're working with just about anybody. I mean, there's your traditional brick and mortar Christian bookstores that everyone pictures, you know, the the department store that's got everything, books, Bibles, music, gifts, all of that. And we work with those guys primarily because that's where we started. So collecting sales information, because we've worked with most of the the big POS systems in our industry to build a data transfer process. So the store doesn't have to do a whole lot except set it up once and it starts transferring to us overnight. We have since expanded out beyond that. Hey, if you're a little church bookstore, you have a book table, you've got a full store in your church. If you can get that connection made to us, we'd gladly accept that data because we want to report that, but we also want to feed information back to those stores to help them. Here's what your peers are selling. Here's what they're not selling. Here's what people have on the shelf that you don't. That kind of information that we can feed back as well. And then we have started expanding out beyond that to ministries or big organizations that are in the Christian industry, the Christian realm, that the intent being they're selling the stuff, it's moving. We've got to get it reported. So whether you're little tiny, you're really big, if I can connect to you, I would love to have it. Because I would love to say, hey, New York Times, here's everything that we're moving through this industry. Hey, BookScan, make sure you get all this stuff reported so it shows up on the list. It's hugely beneficial to the authors, especially in BookScan. If an author is going to go someplace else and write a book, wants to get a publishing contract somewhere new, they're going to go to BookScan. They're going to look at their sales and they have to be able to show what's moved out the door. So that's a big one. We're trying to work with, you mentioned like pastors who are bouncing around, uh, traveling, doing events, that kind of stuff. That's a little more tricky. There's not a real clean setup for those by themselves. But if an event or a pastor can get connected with a store and the store, quote unquote, hosts that event for them and that data comes through from the store, that's perfect. That's just like a store going out and doing an event. So if you can get it connected that way, that works really well. It's very simple. It doesn't cause any alarms anywhere because there are red flags that pop up once in a while. The stuff sells huge quantities in one area that can get stuff blocked on the list. So anything we can do to prevent that and kind of keep those red flags from popping up inadvertently, we want to do that because we want to get everything reported we possibly can because it just benefits the whole. I think where that's really important, you actually touched on this a moment ago, is especially when an author is talking to new publishers and wants to get a publishing contract for a book. What's one of the things we all do when somebody sends us a proposal? We look at their book scan numbers. And if your sales aren't fully represented, one, that can stop or slow the conversation significantly, or 
you're going to have to provide other sales data, other information. And so obviously the more of that data that can show up in BookScan, it's just a win for everybody overall. Next, Eric, I'd love to have you talk to us about maybe some of those kind of top two or three do's or don'ts or maybe best practices. I know I get asked tons of questions from authors and ministries related to reporting data and how do I get on bestseller lists? And I'm sure you get to field questions related to that often as well. But in terms of best practices, do or don'ts, maybe kind of the 10,000 foot level, what are some things that people should have in mind? To try to do anything you can to not look like you're trying to work the system. Because anything that has the appearance of that will catch somebody's eye. You know, there was a story a couple of years ago where someone went out and they bought multiple copies at the same unit, same amount at stores all over the country just to try and force it onto a list. And it actually made it on a list and then they had to do a retraction later because it got caught. People will catch those. They will notice those. Selling stuff prior to it actually getting in the customer's hands. You know, I'm just going to sell a thousand of these right now so I can get on a list and then eventually we'll put them in the consumer's hands through our store, through our ministry. That doesn't really count. That looks weird. And again, people will catch that and say, we're going to flag that. It creates a trust issue moving forward. Those are some big don'ts. You don't want to do stuff, especially in our industry, that looks like you're trying to work the system. (laughs) There's an integrity issue. If we can avoid that, it makes us look better anyway, because that's where we should be. On the do side, get connected to someone who's a store. There's so many benefits of that, obviously on the reporting side, but at the same time, that store now knows you. The store says, what else do you have? Hey, let me just stock those things of yours all the time. Let me tell my buddies about it because now this store has sold it. Now other stores will want to stock it and sell it. The communication and the networking that happens because of that is a big deal there too. And I can say as somebody who is part of the industry on the publisher side, I appreciate kind of the checks and balances, the data integrity uh, steps that are in place today to prevent people from just going out and, you know, hey, I'm going to, you know, through a third party buy 100,000 books so I can make a list. I mean, that just, uh, like you said, it, it damages the integrity of the author, the publisher, the industry, let alone, you know, if it's part of the Christian industry, I would hope we're operating with integrity as much as possible. We've all heard kind of the urban legends and the stories around those sorts of things. So I'm just encouraged that there are safeguards in place to try to keep the data as legitimate and truthful as possible because it creates a more stable and fair playing field for everybody. So I just really appreciate that. It does. And making it equal as much as can be across everybody is a good thing. You don't want it to look like you're trying to buy your way onto a list anywhere. At the same time, you can't always prevent stuff from getting blocked. New York Times, you report everything to them and they have their secret sauce. That's very proprietary to them and nobody. I mean, authors, agents, publishers, nobody truly knows what they do, but they're pulling all those numbers together and then creating their list. And that's important to get that New York Times bestseller sticker on your next one. So let's get everything to them and then hope it makes those lists. BookScan, same thing. There are times they will flag a title because too many sold in one area. So they won't let it make a bestseller that week. However, the numbers are still in the system. When it comes to the yearly numbers, they will allow it to make lists. And you can look up and see how many of something sold, but they don't want to be chasing anomalies and always be explaining away oh, well, that's because one location sold 2,000 of that, or that's because one location sold 14,000 of that. It starts to have people question their lists. So even if it's all legit and you send it, sometimes it still, for some reason, gets blocked. So we do the best we can. We send everything in and we explain up front, hey, this is a big release this week. Hey, this thing is, these are all pre-sales are included in this. So they know. So if one of their little red flags pops up, they can turn that off if need be. So we try and get them that information ahead of time as well, not just blindly send stuff in. You make a good point, you know, in terms of something could legitimately set off a flag and maybe uh, it'll be discounted in terms of bestseller list recognition for that week. But in terms of overall sales reporting, just having those numbers in the system, reporting, reflecting on the monthly and annual sales of a book, that's a good thing. It paints the proper overall picture of what's happening with that book in the retail market. And that's a win for the author and the publisher overall. Absolutely. Eric, in terms of people who might be interested in finding out more about the Parable Group, the work that you all do there, where can we find you on the web? www.parablegroup.com is probably the easiest place to start. And it shows all the stuff we do. We obviously work with Christian bookstores. We work with publishers and vendors. And we also have an agency side of stuff we do. We've always been in the business of getting the right product into the right hand at the right time. And a lot of that was done through catalogs. Let's put a catalog in front of the consumer, the right consumer at the right time with the stuff they're going to want. Obviously, move digital, adding emails to that. Now, we have a whole agency site, and sometimes it's not 
physical product. Maybe it's not a book or a Bible, but it's a ministry who wants to get what they're doing in front of the right people. We will help them do that. So when you're on that site, you'll see some of those types of things and some of the clients we've worked with there that aren't necessarily like Christian book publishers. Well, who's that? Oh, because they have an agency site because we've expanded that because it's a great way to continue the ministry and what we do with that same principle. And like we do with every episode, we'll have detailed links in the show notes, places where you can connect with the Parable Group and find out more. It's time to bring this episode of the Sean Tappet Show to a close. Many thanks for being a part of my conversation with Eric Ernstrom. To learn more about the Parable Group, once again, head over to their website. You can find that at parablegroup.com. And Eric, I just want to say thank you so much for sharing with us today. It's been a pleasure and an honor to have you on the show. Thanks, man. It's been great. 